Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Pat Cosentino and Julie Luby. And we are here from New Fairfield Public Schools to give an update on um, really what's going on with COVID, why our schools stay open, vaccinations, all of these questions that have come in over the last couple of weeks. And we just thought that we'd you know, do a Zoom and, and tape something and share um, our thought process. So as you know, it has um, been very difficult. Uh, it's challenging times um, with not only COVID and the pandemic, but also snow now has entered our um, calendar with the winter months. Uh, we try very hard to make decisions that are best for our children. Um, I want everyone to know that it is our goal to get students in school as much as possible. And I'm very proud of the success we've had doing that. There have been some bumps in the road, which we knew, but um, if you remember, we have to be flexible and uh, we're getting better every day. So um, I guess the first thing I wanna address is a lot of people have been asking about that original plan with um, the red, yellow, and green, and we would close, we wouldn't close. And so basically um, I have meetings every week with the CDC and that plan was put into effect in the summer before we really had a handle on exactly what COVID was and community spread in schools, et cetera. Um, we don't really use that anymore. It was never used for the schools, uh, intended to be used for the schools, but we used it just as some information to move forward because we really didn't have anything. Um, if you saw the news today and yesterday, the CDC has really um, have a lot of data points that shows that schools are safe if you have mitigation strategies. So if you are washing your hands, if you are wearing masks, if you are six feet apart, and I know we're a little close, but we're both okay and have been recently tested. So we wanted to do this together. Um, but um, that's really what we're looking at. We're not seeing a lot of spread in our schools. What's happening is we have a lot of community spread and then that comes into the schools. So really that's kind of where we are. Um, it's always our goal to keep our schools open. Now, why do we close when we don't have a lot of um, uh, spread in the schools? Honestly, the main reason is usually we don't have enough staff. The staff, um, as you all know, they're parts of community, they have families. So some staff members have to be quarantined because someone in their class has had a, po someone in their class is positive. So that's a contact and we quarantine them. We have other staff members whose children have to be quarantined. And so if they live with them and uh, they have concerns, then they're quarantined. Uh, we have some uh, staff members whose schools haven't opened and their children are home and they don't have childcare, so they're home. So that's kind of the thing that happens mostly. Um, we try our best to just move people around. Our administrators are in classrooms. Our special education uh, staff um, have really, you know, been moved all over the place. We have high school people at the elementary. So we're trying our best to keep our schools open. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, we're doing the best we can, honestly. We don't close if we don't have to. If we can just close a small um, percentage of students or just a class, that's what we do. Uh, but there are times we have to close the whole school. And that's really what happened with Meeting House and Consolidated. They just got a, a whole bunch of um, cases and when I say whole bunch, it's like four, but the tentacles just reach out to a lot of people who have to be quarantined. So we are planning to reopen um, both schools on Monday, February 1st. So parents are aware of that. Um, although um, people ask about hybrid and the high school is in hybrid and the high school's in hybrid because it's the only school that is unable to cohort their students because if you're a high school student, you have a math class, you have an English class, you have social studies, you're in PE, you have world language, you have electives with all different kids. You're walking in the halls. And so you can't just keep kids together like we do K-8. So they are um, in hybrid, but because a lot of students have uh, opted to remain home, anybody who wants to be in can be in for the five days. So we have about 450 students who are remote 
and 250 students who are in every day. And we're happy to have more students come. So um, the second semester has started. So come on back if you're ready at the high school. Um, hybrid doesn't work really well in the other schools because um, when half the class is home and half the class is in, uh, if the teacher is in, it's very difficult to have um, um, that set up. It's also difficult when the teacher is home and with and we have to have a sub in for the class that half the class that's in while we're in hybrid. So although hybrid was um, one of um, our initial um, strategies of having kids stay in school, we really feel that either you're in or you're out when it comes to pre-K to eight. That's kind of the way we have been moving. Um, and people have asked about uh, this week and especially, um, so um, on this, this weekend, we had a lot of um, um, uh, cases popping up. And when I say cases, they could be possible cases. So um, popping up at Consolidated. So that's why on Sunday, we decided to just um, put uh, Consolidated on uh, remote learning as well as Meeting House on Monday. And we did that because the weekends um, are really very difficult to do all of this contact tracing. And also um, our nurses are, we have four nurses and honestly, they are running as fast as they can and we need them. And I can't have them working every weekend and every evening, we just can't. So that's kind of um, one of our plans moving forward. If we get a lot of um, COVID noise over the weekend, we just may close that school down for the one day so that we can do the work on Monday. Um, and so that's kind of why we closed down Monday. Um, on Monday, when I knew that I'd have to close the schools for the week in middle, uh, I'm sorry, Meeting House and Consolidated, um, at that point, we knew weather was coming in, okay, on Tuesday. And I'm very aware of the fact that when there's weather or when there's a delay or when there's an early dismissal, families and staff have a lot of juggling to do in their lives. And so I just felt it made sense to have um, the high school and the middle school go on remote learning on Tuesday, knowing that it probably was gonna be an early dismissal day, which it would have been. And it allowed families on Monday afternoon to make plans for Tuesday. Um, because it's hard for some families. They, they have two people who are parents who are working, they need childcare. A lot of time, the older child is the child's care. Um, so that's kind of what happened on Tuesday. And then um, today, which is Wednesday, which is an early dismissal day for everyone, um, it's really inappropriate to have a two hour delay and then dismiss early. Kids aren't even in school for two hours. And that's really very disruptive for families. And it's also disruptive for education. Do you know what I'm saying? The kids, they, they get on, they're on for an hour and a half, then, then it's asynchronous and it's just a lot. So it just made sense for everybody today to have a remote learning day. Um, tomorrow, middle school and high school will be back full-time in session. Um, Meeting House and Consolidated will be back on um, Monday. And for those of you who are not aware, I think you are, but we do have the Ed Advanced Basis program that runs at Meeting House. Um, it is a program that has a, a cost, but it is available for families who need childcare. So um, we are trying to help as much as we can. Okay, so that's kind of that piece. Uh, I'm going to move on to another topic and uh, talk about the quarantine rules. Um, as you have probably heard from the nurses, um, staff and family members exposed to individuals do not have to stay home unless the individual that they're exposed to has developed symptoms or tests positive. Okay, so if you have someone in your house who has symptoms or has tested positive, you now have to quarantine. If you have someone who you think might be ill or whatever, and, and uh, you're just keeping them home, you don't have to quarantine unless there are symptoms or they test positives. positives. Um, families should know that the symptom onset 
after an exposure should result in all family members in the district staying home until, until negative results are um, received. And we tell you this because we have had cases where there's someone home sick or positive and the families have sent other kids to school. And that's really difficult because then we have to quarantine everybody. So please, this has to be a joint effort between families and the schools um, to make sure that you're following the quarantine rules. Um, you know, tests are not required, but for our school system, they're strongly recommended. So that this way we know uh, who we have to quarantine for how long, and maybe we don't have to quarantine. So that's really important for us. Our nurses have been outstanding um, in sharing this information. And uh, if you have questions, please send them an email, I'll give them a call. And also we ask you to be patient and, and, and kind. Sometimes um, um, we get a little um, frustrated and we take it out on the messenger. Um, I can promise you that we are following CDC rules and um, you know we're doing the best we can. So what about the new variants? There's not a lot of information out about the new variants at this time. What I can tell you is we are following our mitigation strategies. We have been told at this point that you know, at this point, the mitigation strategies are working, washing our hands, wearing our masks, keeping six feet apart. Um, and, um, you know, really um, our schools are cleaned all the time. There's Lysol everywhere. There's hand sanitizer everywhere. And everybody has done a great job keeping um, staff and students safe. Um, as far as the travel restrictions, um, the travel restrictions are at this point, if you travel to New York, Rhode Island, or New Jersey, I believe, yeah. um, there are no travel restrictions. If you travel anywhere else, if you go to Massachusetts, if you go to Maine, if you go to Pennsylvania, uh, you do have to quarantine. Um, so we ask that you follow them. They're on our website. Call the nurse if you have any questions. I know a question has come up. Oh, I know that they went to Massachusetts. Why aren't they quarantined? Well, if you have COVID, I guess the positive part of COVID is if you have COVID and uh, you're lucky enough to survive and be healthy, um, you have like a 90 day window where you cannot transmit it or get it. So those people kind of like have a get out of COVID Jumping. free card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh boy. Um, vaccinations. Okay, a lot of topics today. So vaccinations at this point are being handled by the town of New Fairfield. Um, they are um, entering staff into the VAM system, the vaccine medical system. I, Good enough. Yeah, I can never remember that A, but we'll figure it out. Um, and so anyway, administration, vaccine administration medical system. There we go, sorry. And so basically at this point in the state, over 75 is being vaccinated. Um, the next group is going to be 65 to 74. Um, we're hoping and we're assuming that teachers are going and staff members are going to be after that. Um, you have to really um, be vaccinated if you're a member of the New Fairfield um, town and community through the town. So if you haven't had a chance to go on the website and get the information, it's all there because I have been there. Uh, as far as our staffing goes, um, we at this point have submitted names of um, staff members who have had contact, who have contact every day with some of our most challenging students and who have to wear additional PP, uh, PPE. So those uh, names have been given to the town. And so if they are vaccinating and they have five extra vaccinations or someone doesn't show, they're gonna call those people and get them in. So at least we're getting moving with that um, I think with our new president, we're going to see some more um, action and more vaccines um, on the way. Uh, that seems to be the problem nationally and in our state. Um, we have a lot of people who want to be vaccinated. There are just not vaccinations, vaccines available. So, you know, we're hoping that um, that changes and we'll continue to, you know, use our mitigation strategies until it does. So I think that's what I wanted to talk about. And now you can go, Julie. Super. 
So one of the questions that came up was, when do we send letters? When do we not send letters to the community about cases of COVID? And um, the dividing line for that is really, was the case in our school? Mm -hmm. So if somebody were to have um, developed COVID, say over a vacation week, later in the week, when it was clear that they were not ill and could not have been contagious in our schools, then there's no need to send a letter because no one could have been exposed. But anytime there is someone who was in our schools during the time during which they could have been contagious, we send a letter out to the full district letting you know that. Um, we are sending those letters if cases come in over the weekend. So far, we've been sending them 24 seven, seven days a week, but we are looking to send those on Monday mornings if a case pops up over the weekend, just again, so that there can be a little bit of a break in the action. Um, we've been asked about the COVID data. We have a table called the COVID dashboard that is on our website under our, um, uh, on the homepage of the district website in a tab labeled uh, COVID dashboard. And that's where you can see it's updated on Fridays with the cases from the week before. So it'll give you some sense of how many people are quarantining, how many people actually have COVID. Um, and I just want to reiterate one of Pat's earliest points that um, really is what lets us sleep at night, I would say, is that for all of the many people we've needed to quarantine because they were coming in contact with someone who had COVID, those people are not coming back positive. The cases come into the schools, they do not spread in the schools. And that is the saving grace that's allowing us to be in. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I was asked to review was um, where you could find information about remote learning, which is on our remote learning website, which you can find um, by going to the district website and there's a link to it. Uh, there's a lot of great documents there, like the schedule for remote learning. People have been asking about that. There's also the expectations that I just wanted to review a little bit since um, we're reaching the season where we seem to be home a little bit more, whether for mm -hmm. COVID or weather. Um, most importantly, uh, we really do want students to be actively engaged in their learning. We want them to be on the computer when it's synchronous. We want them to have their cameras on, be dressed appropriately um, in a community location, not in their beds. Um, and we want them to interact. We want them to feel like they're in school because they are, their body isn't there, but their hearts and minds can be. Um, they need to turn in their work. And I will say, as compared to last spring, I think what we're doing now, students will tell you, feels like school. I know parents Absolutely. have said, this is just an entirely different program and it's working. So most importantly for the students is we want their cameras on, we want them participating, we want them engaging with their classes. We ask that families supervise and support that. Um, that's our job as parents. We need to supervise, we need to support, we need to help our younger children follow the synchronous instruction schedule. Um, if there's a classroom break, maybe set a timer, but do what you can to help children um, meet their commitments and be where they need to be and check your emails, ch help your children check their emails for communication and feedback. The teachers will uh, provide direct instruction. They will provide whole class instruction. They often will schedule um, synchronous learning for small groups or individuals and they will be checking in on everyone. They will address questions as they come up and do their absolutely best to keep this school thing going. Um, a question came up about after school activities and I wanted to make sure everyone is aware and clear that for students who have selected remote learning, you are still able to and eligible to participate in after school activities and sports. Um, and how about you take that last question? Yes, I absolutely will. Let me just uh, add to sports too. When it comes to the high school and sports, um, we follow the CIAC rules. Uh, they are allowing um, basketball and um, cheerleading. Sideline cheerleading. Sideline cheerleading. Um, no wrestling, although we do have, I think, a little practices going on. Um, weight training. I weight think training. Conditioning. Yes, conditioning. Um, and there's something else, swimming. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not ideal, but it certainly keeps our kids active. And we also have our virtual enrichment activities Abs running. Absolutely, the after school. So that probably will have another one soon, right? Right, we're in the midst of our first session of virtual enrichment activities and we will run a second session um, starting, I think it's like for March, April. Right, absolutely. And, you know, I encourage families, I know it's cold, but we live in New England, bundle up and get out there and hike and walk and, and you know, get your kids outside. 
you know, like we grew up outside. I did anyway. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it didn't matter the weather. Just go outside and 20 minutes, even if it's, you know, 10 degrees is healthy for kids. So, you know, get them outside, get them moving, get them off that screen. Um, it's not what we want um, as far as having them in front of the screen, but it's what we're doing right now. So you have to kind of like combat that a little bit. So with that said, another question we got was, um, how can we best support the district teachers, staff, and what we, what we can offer, if anything? Um, I, I think for me, um, you know, just notes of kindness are always so helpful. Um, you know, every once in a while when we do something, we get a nice little note from a parent. Thank you. I know you're working hard. And, and that goes a long way for everybody, for teachers, for, for nurses, for paras, for bus drivers, for our food workers, for our custodians. Um, you know, that anytime you can just share a little kindness and, and gratitude, I think that makes a big difference. I know it consolidated. The PTO ran a, a, a big uh, drive to have people for recess um, buy things on uh, Amazon and send them to the teachers, which was lovely. Um, certainly, um, you don't need to do that, but you know, anything, you know, just a little candy bar thinking about you, you know, any little kindness is really appreciated. Um, um, we know we're very aware that a lot of our families are, um, um, have suffered during this time, have lost loved ones, have um, lost jobs. Um, there's a lot of food insecurity there. There's a lot of people who are not able to pay their rent. Um, so I'm certainly not advocating for anybody to spend money, but I think that we all can um, do and share kindness. How can you make the world a better place? I'll add, practice grace and assume positive intent. Yes. I, we're all on edge, we're all anxious. And I think, um, you know, no matter what decisions Dr. Cosentino makes, there will be a handful of emails saying you made the wrong decision, whether it's to stay open or to stay closed. We know these decisions impact people, we know it's hard. And I guess I would just say, assume positive intent. Remember that we are all trying to do the absolutely best we can for children, staff, families. And we want to work together as a community. We want your support, support the teachers, let them know what a great job they're doing. We just are so proud of our staff. Mm -hmm. And if anybody wants to contribute to the good work, I would say, say the thank yous, let people know that they're appreciated. It's hard times and a little thank you goes a long way. Absolutely, absolutely. I love that to um, really assume that there's positive intent because there honestly is, um, there's never any COVID, covert actions going on behind the scenes. We don't have time for that. We're too tired for that. And we're probably not smart enough for that. Um, but I just, I also just want to let you know, I'm so proud of the staff. My gosh, during this time, we've been in school since September 2nd. A lot of our neighbors have not. Um, we have been carrying on an instructional program um, and making sure that our kids are engaged and learning. Um, we are building two new schools. Yesterday, I went to um, the architect with a group and we picked out the color schemes and, and uh, we're going to do that for the high school soon. I mean, we're still moving on. And, and so, um, yes, we have COVID. It's a pandemic. We're dealing with it. But we're also moving forward to make sure that our kids um, get the best education um, that they can. So with that said... We are going to sign off. We're going to say thank you for watching um, and stay in touch. Send your questions. Um, we're happy to answer them. We try to call everybody back or at least email back if we get some kind of question or uh, concern. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Be well.